let's just jump right in. We're going to be talking about Acts 6 tonight. So if you have your Bibles, open Acts 6. I tried to put it on ProPresenter. Um, I don't know where ABI is, but the Spanish church has put ProPresenter into Spanish, and I couldn't figure out how to change it. And I couldn't learn Spanish that fast. So, I'm going to give you a second. Judah, I, I said if you had a Bible, flip to Acts 6, and then you didn't move. So, I mean, let's follow instructions. Just, I'm, I'm literally just kidding. That's just me and Judah. Guys, it's me and Judah. Y'all don't... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Me and teacher. Elizabeth knows about that teacher voice. I don't, I don't really pull it out at youth. I, I feel like I keep it... I don't know. The kids at, the kids at like, 5th and 6th grade said... I have, I have a teacher voice. I use my teacher voice when I need him to behave. Anyway. All right. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. It's like a sword drill. Um, Claire has it first amongst. Claire, would you like to read for us? Claire, what translation do you have? The Spanish <laughs> I baited myself. Um, Claire, would you like to read Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7? Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmen Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the numbers of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, let's bow our heads, uh, bow our eyes, close our heads. Sorry, I almost, I almost messed that up. Um, Heavenly Father, I thank you that we get to be here tonight, Lord, and we get to study your word, um, and, and we don't have to do that on our own, Lord, that just as we're going to see in this passage, your, um, your spirit is at work in your church, Lord, and, and you are equipping, and you are helping us, Lord, and you are sanctifying us, and so I ask that you would show us your work tonight, Lord, as we, as we sit and acts, Lord, and, and look at this uh, story as for Help, Lord, as we try after a long day of boring school to uh, to focus and listen, um, and that you would be helping us to see what we need to see and hear what we need to hear. I ask this in your Son's name, Jesus' name, Amen. All right, so uh, a little a little background to start. Okay, I know we've been at least two or three. This is like three sermons now, I think, in Acts. Okay, and so. Um, we started at, at the lock-in, and uh, Mr. Brother Harrison spoke last week, and, uh, and this week we are, we are back in Acts. So, Acts, okay, it is, it is kind of like the sequel to Luke, okay? Acts is written by the same guy, Luke, okay? He was a companion of Paul on his journeys, okay, that you'd get to at the end of Acts, and... Um, He's probably a doctor, probably a physician, and uh, he wrote Luke and Acts to this guy named Theophilus, aka God Lover, so that Theophilus might have certainty. Okay, so so Luke and Acts, it's like a it's like a two volume book. Okay, it's 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 actually just kind of like one story. All right, now um, obviously in the Gospel of Luke, it's 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 the beginnings of Jesus's ministry and what goes on with Jesus. Okay, and then we get the Acts of the Apostles. Okay, that's why it's called Acts. Okay, um, and so Luke has this information because he traveled with Paul and he got to spend time in Jerusalem with Paul and he 
kind of got to be like a little investigative reporter, okay? And so, so Luke is the writer, um, okay? And he's going to pick up writing in Acts where he left off in the gospel, okay? So in the gospel of Luke, Jesus is crucified. He is resurrected. He um, is now going to, in Acts, we're going to get to see how Jesus is building his church, how uh, we get to see in the very beginning the Holy Spirit come upon the apostles just like Jesus promised. Okay, Jesus is going to get ascended back into heaven, and then we get to see everything that plays out. Okay, and so in Acts chapter 1, Jesus says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Okay, and then Acts is just basically that. Okay, Luke's going to show this to be true. Okay, a lot of people split it up that Acts 1 through 7 is the gospel spreading in Jerusalem, and then 8 through 12 is Judea and Samaria, and then 13 through the end of Acts is the ends of the earth. We get Paul ending in Rome in prison. So the gospel has made it to the ends of the earth because at that time the Roman Empire, okay, was, was strong. So, um, so here we are in Acts 6, okay, we're talking about the Jerusalem church. So Paul's not on the scene yet, okay, but this is the very beginning, okay? And so remember um, what we, where we left off, okay? We had Paul and John. I mean, I'm sorry, not Paul. I keep saying Paul because just in my head. We have Peter and John, Peter and John, um, standing trial in front of the priest, okay? The same priest that, that, that put Jesus on trial and, and crucified him, and, and they're getting in trouble for the spread of the gospel, okay? And so we get to see some opposition externally, all right? And now we're going to zoom into Acts chapter 6, and we're going to pick up um, where they left off, all right? And so we're doing seven verses. Thanks, Claire, for reading. And I want us to see three things that I think the passage is showing us, okay? We're going to look at these in, in part. We're going to see the church is growing, okay? The church is human, and the church is provided for, okay? Um, I'll say it again for us. The church is growing, it's human, okay? And it's provided for, Okay, we're going to talk about what, where, where I think we see that. Um, okay, so for, uh, let's start in verse 1. Okay, we're just going to kind of slowly go through this. Not, not too slowly. Don't get, don't get scared. Okay, verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number. Okay, so a big point of emphasis that you're going to see in Acts is phrases that keep popping up that are that are meant to show you the church is growing. Okay, and I don't, you know, sometimes we just read through some narrative, especially, and we can we can go quick, but don't but don't miss this. All right, this is strange. Okay, to everyone else's eyes, right? You had someone come onto the scene and say, "I'm the Messiah. I'm him. I'm God's anointed. Actually, I'm God." Okay, and then his own people crucify him. And everyone going into and out of Jerusalem see Jesus crucified. Okay, so from a worldly perspective, this is this is this should be shocking to us. Not shocking, but it should be glorifying to God that that in these days the disciples are increasing in number. Okay, right, and and we get to see that um, you know that that God saves us through unexpected means. Okay, He uses the weak things to shame the wise, and we get to see that I think. In Jesus is obviously in Jesus' work on the cross, but I think that's going to be shown throughout Acts as well, okay? Where you're going to see this kind of contrast between what, what the world might think and then how the church is actually growing. So, so Luke's going to say this a bunch. The church is growing, okay? And, and just as, you know, to help give us some more context, just as God um, kind of authenticates Jesus' mission on earth and actually Jesus' work on the cross through miracles, through him being raised from the dead, okay, in the same way, okay, the disciples are going to go around, and they're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do miracles, okay, and so I'm saying that because that's what, that's what we just came out of, okay, Harrison just showed us that Peter and John were doing miracles by the work of God, authenticating their message, okay, and look, look at what happens, the disciples are increasing in number, okay, um, and just to give you kind of like, I, I want you to have a little bit of like feeling for the text, like, coming through the first five chapters and you get to this point, this has been something that's been repeated, okay? So you should, as a reader, be feeling Luke emphasizing that the church is growing. 
Acts chapter 1, verse 15. I'm just going to go through the, the ones that lead up to here. And there's a bunch after Luke, I mean, Acts 6, that's going to show us, okay, that this is a, this is a big point of emphasis, okay? Uh, Acts 1, 15. The company of persons was in all about 120. Okay, so, okay, we went from like, you know, we don't know how many people, but we know that there's 12 inner ring kind of people with Jesus, and now we're, we're getting to 120. Okay, chapter 2, verse 41. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. That's a lot. 2, uh, verse 47. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Chapter 4, verse 4. But many believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Chapter 5, verse 14. And, the more, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Okay, and then obviously verse 1 we just read. In those days, the, num- uh, the disciples were increasing in number. Okay, so just, just get a feel for where we're coming from in this passage, okay? Because I, I want us to see what the passage is saying, okay? And, and get a feel for where we're at, okay? Think of this as like a little mini coma, okay? The context. We just got some of the context, okay? This, this has got some steam, okay? We can see the power of God behind this, okay? And, uh, and, and so the church is growing, okay? So that's going to bring us, though, to back to verse 1. Let's finish the sentence. A complaint by the Hellenist arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. All right, so pump the brakes a little bit. Okay, this is point two. The church is human. So we don't get very far into this, this, this passage, all right? And we get to see that the church is human, right? We just saw some external opposition um, with the priest. Okay, that feels like that should be expected. But, but internally, right, we get to see opposition arise from inside of the church. That, okay, and let me, let me just back up here. This, this comes from chapter 4, okay, in verse 32. It says, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said, I mean, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to as many as had need. All right, so that's given earlier to show as the church is growing, this is what's going on. But apparently, it's a little messier than that. Okay, some of the people who were needy were not getting what they needed. Okay, apparently not everyone was getting distributed to them uh, as they needed. Okay, and worse than that, it was falling on ethnic lines. Okay, and we heard a little bit, this this should be a little bit of repeat from Sunday. Um, Okay, when when Pastor Keith talked about this, because we were in this a little bit on Sunday. Right, the Hellenists were Greek-speaking Jews. So now, you know, I, I, I mean, no shock to anyone here. Okay, ethnic disputes within a country can tear it apart, much less a movement, okay? And so we have, we have an ethnic dispute saying, hey, those people, the, you know, the native Jews around here in Jerusalem, they're getting treated better than us, okay? And so all of a sudden, right, this is a lot of people. Don't, don't lose that. Our church is only, what, like maybe 600, 700, 800 people on a Sunday? We're talking about a couple thousand people here, and they don't have some mega church campus where they just come in on a Sunday and, hey, brother, hey, sister, right? They're, li- every, they're sharing everything. They're selling their houses. They're selling their lands, they're sh- right? This is, this is a movement, okay? And, and all of a sudden, when everything's looking so good, when we get to see what's playing out after Jesus left and we saw the power of the Holy Spirit come, okay, don't, don't fly by this, right? There's, there's, there's real issues arising, okay? And it's because the church is human. The church is composed of fallen humans, humans that are still in sin, okay? And so I think there's a point of application that we can take from this as readers who are not in the church right then, but are still in the church today, okay, right? Because of the fall, we now inhabit this kind of, and because of where we're at in in time, we inhabit this weird space. Some people call it like the already, but not yet, okay? Um, Where Jesus has come and he's, and he's, you know, he's resurrected from the dead and he's given us his Holy Spirit. So we're different than the Old Testament, 
okay, believers, but at the same time, we're still living in a fallen world full of fallen people, okay, that are sinners, and we're still waiting for Christ to come back and make all things new. So we live in this kind of weird reality where, yes, we, you know, we've talked about this coming out of our talk on sanctification, right? You, you have the power, the, you know, the bonds of sin and shame are broken, okay, but, but how many of us sin this week or today? Obviously, okay? So, so we live in this weird um, tension, okay, where, where, yes, the church is growing and the Spirit of God is moving and thousands are becoming believers and getting saved and we get to see the actual playing out of all these promises from the Old Testament that promise that, that not only the Jews but the Gentiles would be included and that, th- that this is going to spread to the ends of the earth, okay? And like we just sang, this, this new and better Adam, Jesus, is going to come and build uh, his tabernacle on the whole earth, okay? And he's going to do what Adam couldn't do in the beginning. And yet, it's an unpure, it's an impure movement. There's, there's fallenness, okay? And so, um, I think as teenagers, as someone who has a heart for you guys, and, and for, you know, I feel that the youth should be helping equip you guys to go out into the real world. This is, this is a, you know, I think this is what we're meant to do and and let the Bible do to us when we read it. It's supposed to shape the way we see reality. It's supposed to shape the way that when we go out into the world and we experience life, okay, that we, okay, aren't surprised. Our world doesn't get flipped upside down when on one hand we think the Holy Spirit's moving and God's moving and look at the power. I mean, can you refute thousands of people are becoming believers? And yet there's sin. And yet there's real brokenness. There's real hurt. Okay, this wasn't like, hey, uh, guys, by the way, uh, I think you just forgot to serve these widows. No, this is like real, like anger probably behind these big complaints. Like, that's not fair. You're serving them more than us and, and our widows deserve to get served. Okay, this is, this is, this really does have the potential, like Pastor Keith said, to tear apart this early movement. Okay, this thing that we now call the church. All right, and so I want you to think, and I want you to be able to see that in moments like this, that you get reminded, hey, I live in this tension. I live in this. All right, our church lives in this, okay? When you bump up against the broken, sharp edges of members at church, right? Okay, that you don't think, okay, well, this is not the church for me. Bye. Okay, right? That, that's, I don't know if you guys, you're, I mean, I know you're online, but I don't know how much online you are with like Christian world stuff, but this happens all the time. People go to church, and now church just becomes like, okay, I want to go and listen to a message that makes me feel good, okay, or whatever, regardless. But as soon as I bump up against people in the church, if someone, (laughs) well, what what do I do? Well, I'm an American consumer. I pick up, and I go somewhere else, and I bring my tithe somewhere else, and I just find a different church where I feel better. Okay, and 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 or worse than that. Okay, you you in your own personal life, you come up where you think God's working here, right? And you, you just you had a great time at winter retreat, a great time at youth camp, and then something happens at school, something happens at youth, something happens uh, when you when you get to college, okay? And all of a sudden, your world gets turns your world gets turned upside down. And if you're not grounded in the reality that we see in the Bible, well, maybe our first reaction is. Well, maybe all that other stuff, that stuff that now is further away and is not as real to me, all that good stuff, all that stuff, like, like the Holy Spirit moving in this, maybe that wasn't real. Maybe all this is just, just a sham, okay? And, and, and so, you know, you might leave or you might. So I want us to take a, take a second here, okay? See that, that, that Jesus, okay, the very beginnings of the church with this kind of amazing outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we get to see in Acts, okay, in the midst of that is human fallenness and brokenness, and real pain, and real sin, okay, and real people, thousands of people, okay, and yet, okay, that, that's going to move us to, to the next part, the church is provided for, that in the midst of this, the church is still provided for. All right, so let's, we're going to read now these next, this big chunk here, okay, um, and the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, and a, 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 a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. 
All right, so I'm gonna, I want to notice a few things there in these six verses, but I think these six verses show that, okay, we saw the church is growing, but yet it's human, all right? And, and this is where I think we can find some hope for ourselves, right? And yet the church is provided for by God. Okay, um, right? Don't overlook this. Don't overlook in the middle of, yes, we, I know we talked about this on church on Sunday, about some of the, the kind of, uh, you know, organizational structures that get put in place for the church. Don't get lost in the middle of that. Okay, what I want us to see is that this is the Lord. The Lord's hand is in this. The Holy Spirit there was mentioned at least twice. Okay, and, and they're praying and they're devoting themselves to the word of God. Okay, this is the Lord and this is how he's providing for his church. So don't, don't skip over the fact that this is the Lord who's at work. Okay, this is the same God of Israel who has been providing for his people. Okay, Jesus tells us that, that he's going to build his church and that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church is not going to fall because of this internal conflict. And I think you could actually look out over the, the next few things and see the church is not going to fall from external or internal conflict. Not from the priests who are coming at Peter and John and not from, uh, from within, not from these ethnic fractures and not from people like uh, Ananias and Sapphira. Okay, but the church is going to stand and it's going it's to be, it's gonna, and we're going to see even more trouble like right in Paul's missionary journeys and stuff. But, but right the gates of hell aren't going to prevail against this. And we got to see, I mean, hopefully you saw some of the Old Testament where we were going through with, in the gospel according to God provides. This is all part of his unfolding plan, right, that we just sang about, this wondrous mystery. This is all part of the plan, and God will provide. Um, you know, it is the apostles, don't miss this, full of the Holy Spirit who appoint and pray for and look for servants who are also full of the Holy Spirit, who's going to care for Christ's church in this tumultuous little uh, tiff in the very beginning, okay? The Holy Spirit is in the people who are appointing and the people getting appointed. That's God. That's the promised helper, capital H, helper, that Jesus said he was going to send, okay? And this is how he's helping preserve the preaching of the word, okay, in this in this little trouble. All right, but there's some other things to notice. Okay, um, and you know, I think we can apply this to ourselves as well. Look at the priority placed on the word. Okay, as someone who, who works in church and, and wants to work in ministry, okay, I, I'm perking up at how just these leaders are preserving themselves. For, I mean, prior, are placing such a priority and preserving time for the word. But, but just... As, as anyone, look at this. Look at the priority they're placing on the word of God. Okay, the early church leaders here, are un, they, they understand the importance of preaching. Don't think they're just being like sassy, like, oh, we don't have time to, to dirty our hands with, uh, with serving tables. Okay, we're doing the good stuff. No, I think it's coming from a place of they understand the importance of the word of God preached. Okay, and the importance of prayer as leaders. Okay, and they, and they saw that and they are... They are prioritizing that rightly. Okay, they even valued it above the physical needs of the body. Now, obviously, they don't let those widows go unmet, like, but, but notice the importance they put on the word, right? So you're not church leaders. Maybe one day you will be, but you're not. Okay, but, but still, we should value this, the word like this as well, right? If, if the apostles put this much emphasis on the, on the power of the word this early in the church— Okay, as members of that same church still today, we need to put priority on the word. Okay, do you put priority for the word this high? I mean, do you put it this high in priority? Maybe that's a better way of saying it, right? Do we listen to Sunday sermons like they have that kind of power? Do we? Do we listen like, like, like this is everything? Let me clear my Sunday out. Let me place this at top priority. Let me be ready. Maybe I need a coffee to get me a little caffeinated so I can listen to Keith talk that long. But, but are we sitting there ready? Ready to listen? Are we treating it like, hey, it's, okay, the widows aren't getting fed. We're going to get someone to do that. But we need to devote ourselves to the word, right? Are we, are, so our leaders are doing that. So are we listening to the word that they've devoted themselves to? That God has said yes to them devoting themselves to that because of the importance they place on it. And that's, that's correct. Do we listen like it's that important? 
Or do we treat it like, oh, I don't know, I got to be here. I got to listen. Uh, okay, maybe, you know, I can't make it this week. Maybe whatever. Right? Or even, even in your own personal study. All right, I know that means now in small group, everyone's just going to say they need to, write, they need to read their Bible more. Okay, I don't want you to hear it just like that. But, but do you place, like, I just want you to see, like, I just showed you that the word does have implications for the way that you view reality and you view the circumstances of your life, okay? And right, and we see here that the word has power as well. Are you reading your word like it has power? Okay, are you, are you seeing that as a blessing, that you get the word of God in your hand? You get a copy? We have copies on our phone, okay? We're not thousands of people waiting to hear it from the only people who got to hang out with Jesus, but now we, we get to hold on to this and read it? Are we, are we, are we treating that like it's that important? Okay, um, another thing I think we can, we can glean from this is, all right, how are we serving the church to clear up space for the preaching of the word? Are we serving our church like this matters? Like, you know, we're going to see, okay, obviously there's, there's going to be, a, there's gonna be a, a little bit more organization. There's going to be a little bit more help for that. But, but still, as someone who's a part of the church who gets the ability to serve, do you serve the church with the express intent of not just me listening, okay, or serving because I feel like I have to, I feel compelled now, but because I'm, I'm helping the, the, the word of God be preached and spread among, among the nations, among the people of, of Metairie in New Orleans, okay? Is that how you're serving? Are you serving like, like it matters? Okay, because I think that what we're going to see is that they call up men, okay? They call up servants who serve the church, and, I, and I, it's not said here, but I, I think we can say they serve pretty wholeheartedly, freeing up their leaders so that they could, they could preach the word and devote themselves to prayer. Do we serve like that? Okay? So, I think, we can, I think those are a few things we can think about, but, but big picture, okay, I want us to see that there's men full of the Holy Spirit, so full of God, who are going to help provide for the church in this moment. Okay, and they're going to they're gonna walk in his ways, okay, and they're, they're going to be full of his power, and they are going to help the church grow. That's, that's how God's, God's going to use them by his spirit, so by himself, to provide for the church in this moment. Okay, and so I want us to see that, that although it's human, and although, you know, there seems like a problem here, we can have hope that God, that God is, is at work, and, um, and he is going to make a way for his word to be spread. Okay, in verse 7, we see the outworking of this. And the word of God continued to increase. Okay, so yeah, we didn't get to see, okay, exactly, they didn't, Luke doesn't write for us. Okay, and then they went, and they served food to the widows and everyone was happy again. And then the word, no, it just says they appointed the people, right? They prayed for the people. Um, they laid hands on the people. They did their, they presumably did their job. Okay. And what happens? The word of God continued to increase. Okay. And here's some of that momentum again that Luke keeps picking up on. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And listen to this line. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Look at how God uses what seems like an ethnic dispute, all right, and what seems like from a human perspective, oh no, to let's let's think about that. That's that's a callback. John and Peter were just in front of the priests, right? The priests seem like public enemy number one to the church, right? They are persecuting the church. Okay, we're gonna see in a second, Paul starts to persecute them. Okay, this is a and yet at the same time. Okay, through the issues, the church is provided for. Provided for so much so that the word of God is increasing even so that their enemies are becoming believers. A great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Okay, that should give us hope, right? That, I mean, that's, I, I just think that besides, you know, we could take a passage like this that maybe just sounds like, oh, deacons, I'm gonna throw this one away. I'm gonna go to sleep. And we can find real hope in real points of application, um, even in a text like this. Okay, so, so see that even in the external and internal opposition, okay, um, God's power, God's work, I mean, God's word is at work, okay, and the church is growing, and the glory of God is spreading. Okay, so a uh, few things here, just as we, uh, as we close, just a, a few different applications. 
I know I touched on these a little bit already. Okay, but, but first and foremost, this passage is about the glorious plan of God to bring about salvation through his church, right, through his people, by his spirit. Okay? Um, you know, from worldly standards, the church may not look impressive. It may not look as influential. It may look like it could fall apart in front of our eyes because of the human mess. And yet, it is upheld by his word, through his spirit, and it is being built. Okay? And like I said, I think that can give us hope when we bump into problems. I think it can give us hope when we sit on a Sunday morning and listen to a sermon. Okay, I think it can give us hope when we interact with the world and see how broken it is and see the Bible and see, you know, what the plan is for the world as we wait with hope for um, Jesus to come back and make all things new. Um, I think this can fuel and inform us on how to act and participate in church, right? I, we touched on that, so I don't want to say it again, but, right, but this can... This can influence the way you listen and the way you serve, right? The way you prioritize the word. Um, again, we can see the, I think as you come up in contact with real brokenness, right? Not just, um, you know, from the Bible, but you could let the Bible shape the lens that you see the world in. And, and you can um, not be surprised when you do it, when you see this fallenness, when you see sin in the world, Right? Um, and then finally, I think there is an application for us as a youth that is outside of ourselves. It's not just all, okay, what can I do? What can I do better? Okay, but as we sit in the next little mini-series, right, that Keith's doing on deacons, I think as a youth, we can partner in prayer for deacons in the church, okay? Because I didn't, I didn't mention what's going on here, but, but um, you know, in this passage, it's believed that, that this is a, the setting up of the official office that Paul writes about later, called deacons, okay? And that this is the very first kind of um, installment of that, okay? And so, uh, you know, you heard, you heard it preached on Sunday, and you're going to hear it preached again, and we're going to have a family business meeting about it. And I think, I, I just think as a youth, sometimes we can just kind of let that kind of stuff, that boring adult stuff slide by. But, you know, as, as Aaron would have it, as we're preaching in this verse today, I think a great application that's outside of ourselves and that has, that aligns us with God's will, which is the will of his, you know, of his kingdom being spread and his glory being spread on the earth through the church, would be that we, as the youth, can pray for deacons as the church seeks, right? Look at this, look at this passage. Look what the, the apostles say, right? They, they say, therefore, brothers, this is the apostles, so they have a little bit more special influence given to them by Jesus, and they're talking to the disciples, meaning the believers. They're saying, therefore, brothers, Pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint, right? And we will devote ourselves to prayer, okay? And, and you see that then they pray for the people and lay their hands on them, right? I, I would encourage us tonight to pray for the raising up of deacons in our church so that we would allow Pastor Keith and Pastor Frank and Mr. Phil Okay, and the elders of our church to be freed up to devote themselves for the word of God, okay, and to prayer. Okay, and that we can, that, that you're a part of this. You're a part of the church. If you're a believer, you're a part of this body here at Lakeview. Whether you think you're just hanging out at youth and that you, that's just for when you get older. You're a part of it. And I think as the body, we should be praying for the raising up of deacons here. And so that you would get to see God's word, um, you know, made powerfully, I mean, be powerfully shown here at Lakeview through um, the ways in which God has said to organize his church. Okay, so uh, let's bow our heads and let's, let's pray for that. And then I would encourage us throughout the week that you would be praying for this, that you wouldn't just sit there on Sunday and be like, okay, here we go, talking about deacons, I don't care. All right, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, I thank you, Lord, that uh, in your wondrous mystery, Lord, in your, your plan for all time, that you would be, you know, you would, you would be including us in this, in this plan, Lord, that you would not just have us saved and then swooped away into heaven, Lord, but in your plan, you uh, ordained that the church would be made up of a body of believers, fallen, broken believers, and that your name would be spread and your glory would be made known on planet earth through the church. 
Um, I thank you, Lord, that you've left us your Holy Spirit, that now uh, as believers dwells inside of us and empowers us, Lord. I thank you that you've put us in a church with um, elders full of the Holy Spirit who love you, Lord, and love your word. I pray that as we um, seek to partner with the church, God, that you would put in our hearts people to pray for and for the leadership, Lord, um, and that you would, you would rise up from among us, Lord, people that are full of the Holy Spirit, who are men of good repute, Lord, that would serve your church in a way that your name would be made known greater and greater in our church and in our city, Lord. So um, I pray for all these young people here tonight, Lord, that you would, um, of course, using your, your word, shape the way that they see reality and shape the, the way that they prioritize your word, Lord, and that you'd give them a love and a fire and a desire to read your word. Um, but I also pray, Lord, again, for, for the church and that you would, you would be working in them, Lord, and, and show them as, as they pray, Lord, reveal to them the ways in which you're shaping their heart and that you're, you're conforming their will to your will as they pray for leaders uh, in the local church. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.